Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a very warm and uh, overly generous introduction, and I thank you very, very much. Uh, this is a very uh, intimidating assignment to talk to this uh, group. I'm, I'm really in awe of what National Academy members uh, have accomplished for our state and for our country, and it's an honor and a privilege to be asked to talk to you today. And I sincerely uh, thank you for what you've done for our state and our country and continue to do every day. And what I want to talk to you about today is uh, the continuation of that success that this country and this state has had and elicit your help in making sure that we can continue that for um, my seven grandsons and hopefully great grandchildren to come. And I think that's really what's at stake here in our state and in our country. And I want to start really with three propositions. One, the nature of the problem we have. Number two, the solution that we have to that problem. And number three, what you can do about it. First, let's talk about the nature of the problem. The nature of the problem in our country and in our state is not just assuring the future generation of Nobel Prize winners and National Academy members. That is absolutely critical. But equally important is the fact that we have to convince the public that math and science in the 21st century is necessary for every student, whether they want to become an engineer, a scientist, a National Academy Award winner, or whatever. And that's a harder sell. And it's going to require all of us to speak out. Let me give you a couple of things to think about. First of all, 80% of the jobs created in Texas the past 10 years required either a college degree or a technical community college certificate of some kind or another having to do with the skill. And I get asked a lot when I talk to audiences across the state, well, you don't understand. Uh, Johnny's good with his hands. He doesn't need to know math and science. He's going to be a plumber. He's going to be an automobile mechanic. Well, guess what? If you want to be an automobile mechanic today, you have to be computer literate. You have to read technical manuals. You have to really know your math and science. And the odds are you have to have completed a community college degree in that subject, and you're not going to do that if you've not conquered algebra. Those are the facts. Algebra is the key predictor of community college or college success, period. It is the predictor. Look at this information here, though, to see the sobering data that we have. And I want to thank the Houston Endowment and the Higher Education Coordinating Board in our state that prepared this data for us. And as you look at those numbers, what this is longitudinal data of every student in the state of Texas and whether or not they completed college. In other words, we start with a count in the eighth grade and we want to find out did they complete college or did they complete a community college or other certificated program such as a welder, somebody who can work on the Intel factory floor. In other words, the type of certificate that you need today to be more than a minimum wage worker. And that's basically the two kinds of jobs we're creating today are minimum wage jobs and what I call living wage jobs that are predicated upon math and science. And look at the data. We had a total of 300,000 plus eighth grade students in the fall of 2000. 11 years later, 11 years later, only 20% had accomplished one of those two goals. So in an environment where 80% of the jobs require <laughs> what 20% of the students are getting, that's a problem. 
And it doesn't take a mathematician to figure that out. Stop and think about it. 80% of the jobs and only 20% of our workforce are going to be qualified for those jobs. Folks, that's a looming disaster on our hands. And you can't close your eyes and say, well, math and science isn't for everybody. Well, it is. Margaret Spellings, who I had the pleasure of working with for many years as the Secretary of Education, used to say, you know, you can go to a cocktail party, and before long, somebody will brag to you that they can't balance their checkbook. They would not brag to you that they can't read. That's a cultural issue. That's a cultural issue, folks. And that's an issue that we have to confront. And we have to say, no, really, math and science is for everybody. It's for girls. It's for African-American students. It's for Hispanic students. It's for football players. It's for every kid to have to master certain levels of math and science. And who better to carry that message than people in this audience? You understand that. You understand the importance of math and science to critical thinking. And really, if you stop and think about our education system, that really is the transition from rote learning is critical thinking. And that's developed through the math and science curricula of our districts. So folks, we have to acknowledge, grab hold of the problem, and say, yes, math and science is for everybody. Well, I can hear you saying now, at least under your breath, well, that sounds good, but don't you know we have a lot of poverty, we have this cultural problem, we have the breakdown of the family, we have teenage pregnancies, we have drug problems. I've heard all of the reasons why it looks overwhelming to do anything in our public schools, let alone address math and science. And I, I say to people, when I started working on education reform in 1983, you had to explain to people we had a problem. Today, you have to explain to people that we have a solution. There's an enormous amount of um, just lethargic, almost give up on our public education system that the problems are overwhelming. That's what led to the creation of the National Math and Science Initiative because we have data that shows that in every kind of school with every kind of population, every bad cultural problem, every bad teacher pay problem, every bad working condition problem, we know success is not only possible, it's being done. Now, when that is true, I take that as enormous good news. In other words, let's accept the fact, let's don't argue anymore about whether this is possible. It is possible. And I can take you and show you individual schools that work. I'll start with, as Sarah mentioned, one of our programs started here by Peter O'Donnell many years ago. Let's go to our chart here. Now my math and science skills are such that, there we go. Now look at this data and this chart. This says when Peter started this program in 10 Dallas public schools, look at 1995. Now that's the depressing start. In 1995, there were only 29 African-American and Hispanic students in 10 Dallas public schools. That's an average of three per school that were passing AP math and science exams. Three. Today, there are 1,153. And that chart goes up every single year. And I've lost count, but I think during that tenure, we probably had eight superintendents in the Dallas Independent School District. And yet, look at those results. So when people say to me, oh my goodness gracious, 
we, we can't solve this problem. Why can't we? With a program Peter started, and you all know Peter, I bet you've seen the wow chart before, and he has three simple principles that led to the creation of that program. Teachers matter, incentives work, persistence pays. And that chart goes continually up. Now the concept, as Sarah said, of the National Math and Science Initiative and what ExxonMobil decided to support was saying, well look, if we can do it in Dallas, why can't we do that every place? Well, believe it or not, that's a profound concept in education. Stop and think about the fact of all of our jurisdictions, all of our political subdivisions. In Texas alone, there are 1,052 school districts. There are 6,500 campuses. But look, folks, if you can do that in Dallas, Texas, why can't you do it in every city in Dallas, I mean in Texas? You can. And that's what the National Math and Science Initiative is proving. We were founded, uh, we've been in operation four years now, and in four years, we've taken this program to 19 states, 495 high schools. In the first year in a high school, we averaged a 65% increase in passing scores in math and science, a 65% increase. That's with the existing teacher core, that's with existing teacher pay, that's with existing discipline problems, that's with existing this, existing that, it works. Three years later, an average of 165% increase. 165 it, and the cost, $150,000 per high school. $150,000 per high school. Now why in the world are we not doing this all over the country? If we really buy into the fact that we have a problem, then why aren't we in every school district? You know one of the key reasons this program works? It's open enrollment. We say to a school when we go there, nope, we don't want the guidance counselor to say Juan really doesn't want to take AP chemistry or Juan really can't pass AP biology. Juan can if given a properly trained teacher. And that's what we do. So when I hear despair about the problem, I, I, I just can't buy into that. But I can buy into the fact that if we're not doing this everywhere, that's lack of political will. That's it, period. It's lack of public will. There's not sufficient demand that this occur. Give you another example. Here in Texas, this program with those results in Dallas, we're in 29 school districts. Remember I told you there's 1,052? Why in the world are we not in 1,052? If the future of our state depends upon that, why are we not there? Well, one reason is the legislature defunded the Advanced Placement Incentive Program and in last legislative session. But number two, why hasn't the, the private sector stepped up and the public stepped up and said, in our school districts, we're talking about $150,000 per high school, why don't we have this program? Our high school budgets, we spend about Mm, between 35 and 40 billion dollars a year on K through 12 education in Texas. And we don't have $150,000 to do this in a high school. Now folks, that's just wrong. <laughs> and besides that, it's kind of stupid given the, produce, the results that we're producing. Now in addition, we were producing those results prior to Peter starting another endeavor called Laying the Foundation, which was to train middle school teachers to teach at a pre-AP level. And so now we're doing that. So keep in mind, we're producing a 65% increase in the first year without pre-AP in existence, 
165% increase over three years without pre-AP. Now we've built in pre-AP to further even build the pipeline more. You say, well, now wait a minute, is AP really that important? Let me give you the longitudinal data in Texas. If you're an African-American student and you pass one AP course in high school, not just in math and science, in any subject, college graduation rate goes from 15% to plus 60. You know, what it, you know what that does to an individual's life? To go from a high school graduate to a college graduate? Hispanic student goes from 15 to plus 60. Anglo goes from 35 to 75. Why? Because we're saying to students, you can achieve at a higher level. Expectations matter. Standards matter. Rigor matters. So this is a powerful program that's affordable, it works, it's scalable, it ought to be in every public high school in this state. Now in addition to the short term tremendous impact, we're doing something about the next generation of teachers and that's the You Teach program, which as Sarah mentioned, a program started at the University of Texas at Austin, very novel concept, uh, which is teachers really ought to know what they're going to teach. They ought to know the content. <laughs> so we do something pretty unusual, and that is we have entering college freshmen enter the College of Natural Sciences and Math, not the School of Education, and they graduate in four years with the same BS any other student does, but also a teaching certificate. And the data shows from the University of Texas at Austin, it's been in existence 15 years, 92% of the students who graduate from that program go into teaching. That's a higher percentage than the kids who graduate from the School of Education at the University of Texas at Austin. More remarkably, 85% are still teaching five years later. You don't have the turnover problem. Even though they've got BS degrees, they could go to work for ExxonMobil, they go into teaching and they stay. Why do they stay? They stay because they can make kids' eyes light up and they can make a difference in children's lives. They don't get frustrated. If you're a struggling teacher who's trying to stay a day ahead in your assignments, it's very difficult to make a student's eyes light up. And if you can't make a student's eyes light up, it's not going to work in math and science. I happen to think the concept's valid in a lot of other subjects, but I know it's true in math and science. You can't teach what you don't know. So this program, thanks to ExxonMobil and numerous other donors, some of whom are in this room, and the O'Donnell Foundation, we've expanded this program. University of Texas at Dallas, David has the program. We're in 34 universities already in four years. We've replicated that program in 34. And if our United States Senate would just listen to Senator Hutchison, she author, inter, um, introduced a bill and helped draft a bill that adopted the National Academy Rising Above the Gathering Storm report that recommended that you teach be expanded all over the country. She got it authorized. Congress has not appropriated it. But notwithstanding that, thanks to private donors, some states who have stepped up, we're in 34 universities and we're going to announce another grant in March to go to 10 more. 10 more tier one research universities are going to compete to be added to the program. That'll be 44 universities. And pretty soon we'll be turning out 10,000 teachers a year. 10,000 teachers impacts millions of students over the lifetime of their career. So we're attacking the short-term problem with our existing teacher core. We're attacking the longer-term problem of the next generation of our teacher core, and it's working. And it's working because people have stepped up. I mean, ExxonMobil made an extraordinary gift when they committed $125 million. 
Uh, I don't care who you are and what company you are, $125 million is a lot of money. <laughs> more importantly, even more, and I, don't tell Ken Cohen I said that, but even more important than the $125 million is for one company to step up and say, we're going to reallocate resources behind a program fully and not just adopt the let a thousand flowers bloom and give $100,000 to a whole bunch of people and the needle never moves. That's a huge uh, strategic decision by ExxonMobil to say we need to pick a few things and really get behind them with not only our treasure but our people, our time, and our talent. And we need more donors who will adopt that attitude because results really do matter. When we can now walk in to policymakers or school officials and say, wait, I'll give you one example. We started this AP program, wonderful uh, adaptation of it by taking it to military schools, not Department of Defense schools, but schools outside military bases, where our military families are desperate for their children to learn math and science because they know their life depends on math and science. You don't have to convince a soldier that math and science is important today. So they want their kids to take math and science courses. Well, we, we went into these individual schools and we launched one outside Fort Carson, Colorado. And in the first year, we went from zero students passing AP math and science courses to 99 in one year. Now, first of all, it's a disgrace that did, didn't have any graduates before we got there. But number two, to people who say to me, we can't solve the problem, uh, how, how can you refute data like that? So all of a sudden, the governor of Colorado now wants to do the program, the governor of Oklahoma, where we took it to bases, it's now spreading across the state. So this can work, folks. And the bottom line is, all of this started thanks to a National Academy report called Rising Above the Gathering Storm that not only recommended these programs, but then some far-sighted people like Peter O'Donnell and Chuck Vest and Norm Augustine and ExxonMobil stepped forward and said, well, how about for a change, we not only issue the report, we actually implement what the report recommends. And that's what the National Math and Science Initiative is about. It's about proven programs, replicable results, and changing the dynamics in our state and in our country. So I hope you can leave with a message. One, understanding, and I know you, you knew this before I stepped up here, that we have a problem in math and science in our country in our K through 12 public education system. But I want you, what I want you to leave with is understanding there is a solution. And three, what can you do about it? Well, it sounds trite, but you can call your local superintendent and say, do we have this program? If we don't, why not? Why not? It's affordable, it produces results, you can call your state legislator, your congressman, ask them to fund the academic competitiveness program that Senator Hutchinson passed. And again, this is not a money problem. I'll give you one last bit of data. When I was in Washington and Senator Hutchinson was working on the program, we studied how much the federal government was then funding to help math and science K through 12 in the United States. At that time, and that was five or six years ago, it was funding $3.5 billion annually in 127 programs. 124 had not been evaluated for results. Three had. Of those three, two produced negative results 
and one produced positive results. But we're saying we don't have the money to increase these two programs. That's not very smart. So, one, we have a solution, and two, you really can make a difference by saying to people, why don't we have this program? And every now and then somebody will say to you, well, AP is just for white suburban kids. Nonsense. This is for every child. And our data shows our increases in the first year and over three years are actually higher with minority students and females than they are on average because we give opportunity and we give incentives. So one, thanks so much for all you all have already done. And two, I hope you'll help us spread this program across the country. And I'll be happy to respond to any questions. I understand that we've out allocated some time on that. So I'm happy to respond to any questions you might have. But thanks very much for the opportunity to talk to you. David. I've got a comment. I hope everyone can hear me. I guess you will. Uh, at UT Dallas, we've looked extensively at our retention and graduation data, and I just got the report a few weeks ago. Carolyn knows a little bit about this information, but we've looked at retention and graduation, whether you're Pell Grant or not Pell Grant, and there's no difference whatsoever, male and female, very little difference. In fact, as we look at everything, there's only one parameter that sticks out as a big difference in success. And surprisingly to us, it's whether or not that college student has taken or, and passed or not taken and passed at least one AP class. And so for us, the freshman re sophomore retention rate's around 95% for students who have taken or passed at least one AP test. And it's down around 70% for those who have not. And so we have adjusted our merit-based scholarships, and we will not give them unless the student has taken and passed at least one AP test uh, uh, because the correlation is so, so strong. So it's not just in those school levels. It's actually graduation from uh, college. So congratulations for uh, giving us more well-qualified students. Thank you. So I just wanted to link in the program that we heard about last year with the elementary school kids that they're using the computer program that is the math ready, I'm not sure what it is, but. Reasoning mind. That I think. is, yeah, yeah, and I didn't hear you mention it, but it sounds like that's a beautiful program for getting the elementary schools prepared for the middle school programs that you're talking about. And we were really impressed by the work that they were doing from the last meeting. So. We are constantly looking at which elementary programs we ought to try to take to scale. We, we started in an unusual way. A lot of people start by saying, let's start working on three-year-olds and move up the age spectrum. We said we can't afford to write off another generation. So we're gonna start in high school and then we're gonna work downstream. We're down now to sixth grade with our pre-AP program and sooner or later we'll adopt a scalable program that can impact elementary schools and uh, kindergartens and pre-kindergartens, but the whole concept of the National Math and Science Initiative is one, let's discontinue the pilot disease we have in this country where we adopt pilot program after pilot program and we never light a central air and heat system. Um, we, we just simply want to abolish pilots and say we're going to concentrate on three or four programs and drive them one more fact to keep in mind, uh, and, I always, and I hope you understand the way I say this. When a company says to me they've got a wonderful program that's helped a thousand kids, I say that is fantastic for those thousand kids. But you know what? We have 55 million children in our K through 12 public school system. 55 million. So we have to think in scale. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Even if we pick 
the two programs that weren't absolutely the two best in the country, the fact we're driving them across the country is what's going to change the course of our country. Thank you. I'm very happy and very impressed with all that you've done, okay? And I support, as you know, Peter, you all that. You refer to it as the problem and the solution, okay? And I want to say you should refer to it as a problem and a solution because I see the critical problem right now is the high school dropout rate, okay? I work with Hispanics and African Americans in Houston, Texas, where the males are dropping out at above 65%, okay? So while we're solving a, a one problem here that I'm very happy with, the dropout rate is what's really killing us across the country. Well, let me say this. Uh, obviously, there are lots of problems that we need to solve in our country. We think what we need to do is start solving some problems where we can make a measurable difference quickly. I'll give you one bit of information. For instance, we're constantly bemoaning the fact that in this country we don't have kids interested in math and science. Uh, national data shows that 25% of our high school population is interested in pursuing a STEM degree and has zero proficiency in math and science. Zero. So these are high school students who haven't dropped out, have interest, and don't have proficiency, let alone the ones that enter our universities intent upon pursuing a STEM degree, and 40% of those drop out of the STEM field and graduate in other fields. So we think right away you can, I don't mean it in these business-like terms, but you can segment your market and say, we can make an immediate impact uh, by focusing there, and then we'll move on to other problems. So I certainly don't bemoan a, a I don't treat in a cavalier way the high school dropout issue at all. It's a huge issue, but uh, we were organized and dedicated to attacking the STEM problem. Tom, doesn't that latest foundation program kind of speak to uh, preparing the kids in middle school so they would have Yes. The optimism for success and not drop out in high school if the Lay the Foundation program achieves its results. And I'm not an educator, I, you know, or anything else for that matter, other than a, somebody who believes in the cause. Uh, but it would seem to me that if you get the kids improved self confidence as a result of the Lay the Foundation, then the, pro the incentives, the rewards, and so on for sticking with it, I would hope would have an impact on the dropout rate. I, I don't know if you've, if there are any metrics on that or if anybody's asked, but it, it, as you described it, it sounded to me like a, a seamless approach. We, we think it will make a, a significant difference. We just haven't had the pre-AP long enough to know that, or have the data points to prove that, but we sincerely believe that. Well, again, thank you all for what you all have already done for our state. Thank you.